right view. There we go. All right. Um, and I got to click that out of the way. Anyway, um, this is sort of a, a, a lot of stuff to go over. I understand most of you are probably trying to get this meeting in Park City, and I'll try to get you done uh, 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 well ahead of time so that we can roll on. Um, the, the topics we've got today are ROP um, and retinal blastoma and uh, abusive head trauma, kind of looking at it from a pediatric ophthalmology perspective of pediatric retina topics, uh, not to confuse what Dr. Hartnett, Dr. Wong may tell you, or uh, what Eric Hansen, our wonderful new um, you know, ocular oncologist may tell you about retinal blastoma. I'm in the process of kind of shifting patients over to him. And this will probably be the last time I give a talk on retinal blastoma. You know, to review ROP, we want to kind of go through, and I put on that cheat sheet that I set out, the things that, you know, the, that are, are really pertinent in terms of zone stages and the issues that allow us to decide whether a given child is likely to do okay or need treatment. Um, so I need somebody to tell me about the zones. Just a volunteer, unmute yourself, chime in and share it with the group, and we'll try to suffer through this on Zoom, although this is much better in person. Who wants to tell me about zones? Tell the group. I can do that, Dr. Hoffman. This is Tyler. Um, yep. So we have three zones. Zone one is two disc diameters from the optic nerve. Uh, zone two extends from the border of zone one out to the nasal aura serrata. And then zone three is the remaining temporal portion uh, beyond zone two. Now zone one is really not just two disc diameters. It's twice, it's a circle whose radius is twice the distance from the center of the optic nerve to the fovea. Right. Okay. So, yeah. and if you want, just from a practical standpoint, if you take a 28 or a 30 diopter indirect lens and you put it, so the optic nerve, you're looking at temporal retina from the optic nerve. The optic nerve is just at the edge of the field. With either of those lenses, you're pretty much looking at zone one. And, and it's, it's a pretty good estimate. You know, if you just look at the optic nerve, look at the fovea and say, well, twice that distance, that's a pretty good way to gauge things. You know, the thing you can't do is look out temporally and see anything that's going to tell you categorically I am in zone two or zone three. So that determination is made by looking nasally. And if vessels go out to the nasal aura, we assume that anything we see on the temporal side is in zone three. Now, what about stages? Who wants to run through that quickly? I could run through that. And uh, this is Lydia. Okay. Um, so there are five stages. Recently, a, sec a, a sixth stage was added, but the traditional five uh, stages that I believe were still tested on is stage one is a demarcation line, where there's just uh, between vascular and avascular retina, there is a flat white line. Stage two would be a ridge that is elevated and a little bit pinkish. Um, the third stage would be a ridge with uh, uh, extra retinal blood vessels, where there's some neovascularization and uh, some tufts that are called popcorn. Um, stage four is a subtotal retinal detachment, where there's some, um, it can be divided up in extra fovea and including the fovea. And then stage five is a total retinal detachment. And then I think there was the stage of the aggressive ROP that was added recently, but I don't believe we're tested on that one. Well, it's yeah. really been around for a long time. Um, what they did in the most recent uh, uh, iteration of ICROP was change what we called aggressive posterior ROP uh, to aggressive ROP. Um, but that uh, determination was actually uh, um, added in the 2005 iteration of the international classification. That was a good description. I like that. Now tell me, Somebody else tell me, as far as pre-plus and plus disease, what did you, what's your understanding of that? Tell, start with plus disease. So uh, this is Sean Kahn. Plus disease describes uh, vascular tortuosity, specifically uh, arterial or tortuosity and venous dilation of the vessels. And there is a standardized sort of uh, photograph that denotes what plus disease and what plus disease 
you know, what, what, what is less than plus disease, pre plus disease would be anything that is more uh, tortuous and dilated than normal, but not meeting criteria for plus disease. And uh, in the more uh, recent uh, international classification of ROP, they talked about how uh, they acknowledged that the, this disease exists on a spectrum while maintaining the, the classifications of pre plus plus disease. Yep. And, and, and probably just an important aside is that the original photographs that were published with the cryorop study of plus disease were taken at the Moran Eye Center, then over in Clinic 8 University Hospital by Paula Peterson. I mean, Paula, Paula Morris, rather. Paula Morris, our uh, ophthalmic, original ophthalmic photographer here at the at Moran Eye Center. And uh, that was taking a baby that was brought over from the NICU, put on a Mayo stand sideways using a Zeiss fundus camera to take photographs uh, to come up with a standard photo of plus disease. Um, and that's where those photos came from. Um, so that when you wow. look at those, understand that it was done here. It was done with a great deal of effort and a kid that was intubated, bringing the ventilator and the baby and an isolate and everything over to photography um, in the ophthalmology department. Now tell me about type one and type two. Where did they come from and what does that change? I mean, what, what's that mean when you hear type one and type two in a short description? I, I can do that one. So sure. These are the uh, classifications of what, what is and what isn't threshold disease. It's based on the, the ETROP study. And so type one, if you have any sort of disease, any plus disease in zone one that needs treatment, if you have stage three in zone one, but it's without plus disease, you have treatment. So anything in zone one, stage three, or plus disease you're treating. And then zone two has to be stage two or three with plus mm -hmm. disease. Right. And then type two that's doesn't need treatment is, you know, anything less than that. But if it's um, stage one or two without plus disease in zone one or uh, stage three without plus in zone two, but basically anything that's not type one. Right. So in a nutshell, if you, Type one, they need treatment. Type two, they're worrisome and we follow closely. And a lot of the type two kids are the kids that we would see at less than a week. You might see the baby again in two or three days. Now, aggressive posterior ROP or aggressive ROP as it's now termed, um, the, the, the real kind of take home about that is that it looks different. You know, when we first started looking at these kids in the cryorop study, and we were one of the study centers here. I was the, the, the local PI. Um, we saw babies that it was hard to tell if they actually had a great, you know, had ROP and that vessels just ended very posteriorly. And they'd often have some hemorrhages. And over time, what we came to appreciate was that you don't see classic stage three in those kids. If you see dilated vessels, it looks like plus disease and the vessels end abruptly, you need to get out your 20 diopter lens and look closely because you can have all this very flat neovascularization that is at times hard to appreciate. And those eyes go downhill quickly and they do need treatment. The other reason I want you to, the way to think about aggressive posterior ROP is those are the kids that benefit the most from anti-VEGF treatment. That's the, the, the group that's been shown to have very clear benefit where that is almost always the preferred treatment. And you see dramatic resolution of those changes. You have to watch them because it may come back later. Now let's, and let's see here if I can, yeah, okay. Um, so we're gonna do a little game here. And you know, in the, the auditorium, we divided everybody in half. And what I'm gonna do here, if we look at our, our group here, do we still have just nine of us on here or eight of you? So let's, yes. okay. And we only have one senior resident, right? I think that's me. <laughs> That'd be you, Catherine. So Catherine, you're in charge of uh, one uh, team. Uh, Sean, you're in charge of the other. And uh, uh, we'll have four and four. And Catherine, you probably 
get uh, more if there are more first years uh, on, on your team and divide yourselves up. Catherine, uh, uh, your, your team is uh, the uh, uh, laser stars. And Sean, your team, you're the anti-VEGF wizards. So stars and wizards. <laughs> and, and we don't have, but, but the idea with this, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some patients on uh, the academy's uh, case-based learning system and kind of work through those. And what I would suggest we do uh, is we each keep track of our own scores on the team. And you can add them up later while we're doing something else and, and talk yes. about it. Uh, the way I, I envisioned the scoring was for the third years, you get one point for everything you get right, each part of the case, and, the, and, and minus three for everyone you get wrong. Uh, second years, two and two. And the first years, you get three points for everyone you get right, and only one point off for everyone you get wrong to kind of even the playing field. And I need to stop the share of, let's see if I can do this. We'll stop the share of this momentarily and we're gonna digress. If this will let me do it, there you go. Stop the share. And then we're gonna come back to one second here. And how am I gonna get out of this? This is not letting me here. Let me hit escape. Not letting me do that. I need to come up here. Let's do this. And do, 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 do. documents. I think uh, the PGY twos, you guys and I, oops, sorry. You guys and I can all be on a team. And then the yeah. PGY. All the PGA threes, I think, are here. So you guys can all be a team. Does that sound good to everybody? That sounds good. Sounds oh, really yeah. good. And I'm trying to <laughs> get this up here, and it is not cooperating, but we'll figure it out, I suppose. And so now I need how do I get out of screen share without? Hmm. I think you're out. Am I out? Okay. Yeah. I think and how do I get now. this to end show? There we go. End show. Good. Now I can close or put that down here. And then if I go to the, and I had this up on. Okay. And this was up before, but we'll go to it. AAO.org. Sean. Oh, I said, Sean, just because there's two of you doesn't mean that we get more points. <laughs> that was a slick trick, but you caught me, Cole. Sorry for the delay. I had this up ready to go, and somehow my computer decided to boot it. So we're going to go to this again here. And all right, so launch this. And then we'll start that. And then then I've got to get out of somehow back to zoom. <laughs> to share the screen again. Any ideas? If you just share your whole screen, like the first screen in the top left corner, when you click share screen, it'll show I'm us. I'm not on whatever. anywhere where I can see share screen. That's the problem. Oh, I see. Abigail's uh, headed over right now. You, let's see, show management, exit, stop video. Oh, start share. There we go. Start share and Let's go to this and see if this works. You see it now? Yep, looks good. Case based yes. training? Good. Okay. So, and I kind of previewed these to look here and let's see what we got. So, first up, what we do is the we'll alternate kind of patients here, if that's okay. And so, the um, 
stars you guys are up first and i just need somebody on the team to give me an answer we'll put it in here we'll see how we do each keep track of your own answers and grade yourselves and we'll we'll do it so with this the idea is we're going to go through right eye and left eye and we have to decide what zone we're in what stage we're in plus is it you know what how, how bad are things do they have aprop um, and uh, when do we want to see them again or do we want to treat them? And I can, if you ask me to, I can zoom in and I'm going to move this up. And now, so this, this patient is a 671 gram at birth kid who's now 35 weeks, 24 weeks uh, at, at birth. So a little teeny peanut. And this is the view that we have and when we look at this kid we want to look at these posterior vessels this is where the dis distinction you know of of um are the vessels dilated venous vessels are the arterial or vessels tortuous and um then we're going to look nasally this is the nasal retina in this right eye notice this stuff right here um, that's kind of, you know, where the action is. And then we're going to look here again, again, more of the nasal retina. And then temporally, you see something going on out here as well. You want to notice the distance from optic nerve to the fovea and where we are in terms of putting things in. And is one of you, are one of you calling me? No, I don't think so. Okay then I'm going to ignore that because somebody's calling me and they can, I just want to make sure that I suddenly hadn't gone offline or something and somebody's trying to reach me at which point I'll, uh, I'll talk to you. And otherwise I'm not going to answer it, but bottom line here. So what do we think here as far as right eye, what zone are we in? So I would say zone two, since we okay. at least get nasally, uh, I would say Great. probably, yeah. I would probably say stage two. It looks more like um, a ridge than a, just a line. Okay, and let's go back here for a second. And look at this photo closely. Okay. <laughs> it's hard to, let me see. These photos Maybe. are hard to tell. Let me give you a magnified view. Oh, thank you. Maybe, what do you guys think PGY 2s? Two, Maybe stage one, then uh, stage one. I would say oh, page three because it looks like there's oh yeah right yes stage three okay stage three very good so now I need to see if I can minimize this get back to where we were stage three now is there plus disease three I would plus say disease? I would say no okay and so if, um, and so where would you put this? If we're saying there's no plus disease and we're seeing stage three, where would that put us? It would put us in, um, it would be type two. Type two, okay. And then um, is it APROP? No. No, okay. And when do you wanna see this kid again, based on these findings, you want him to bring the right eye back and, and what interval of time? <laughs> probably one to two weeks okay now let's look at the left eye okay and what we can do is is um score this and how about if we go on this this eye let's have the um the other the opposition weigh in let's try it right and left here so you're going to be our left eye folks here uh wizards and uh um, we're looking here at nasal retina. There might be something going on out here. Give you the advantage of some magnification. And let's look at the nice picture of the kid, right? Hmm. And let's look up here with some I magnification. Just to okay. And I got a page. Tyler, you're not muted by the way. So if you don't want us to hear your advice, you may want to do that. Um, and uh, so, and let's look with magnification here, looking na <laughs> nasally, 
at this uh, left eye. Um, and I'd take a good careful look out here. What do you think we should put on here, Wizards? The uh, What zone are we in? Two. Two. What type of ROP do we have? We're thinking stage three. Okay. And is there plus disease, pre plus? Oof. Debate. Um, it's either pre plus, pre plus or plus, but we're having yeah. trouble deciding. I think we might be split two and two. Let's go with plus. Okay. And it's not letting me click plus. Oh, Isn't that's that a, interesting? That's a hint. Yeah. Wrong answer. Oh, here. Uh, no, it, it is now. It's just not responding. And so where would this put us? If we've got stage three with plus disease in zone two? Treatment requiring. Treatment requiring. And then uh, is this APROP? I don't think so if it's zone two. I, I and 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 so now let's submit this stuff and see what we got. Okay. Oh, we might see either. Here we go. So look here, and and, and our answers oh, here man. actually the <laughs> wizards did well, which would make me think that the stars might be suffering. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, come on, let's go back over here and see what we've got. And so right eye incorrect but it's not letting me go back here maybe close the case and then um, open it again yeah maybe that'll let me do oh here we go yeah you got it thank you so Ugh, um, it's plus it's plus disease which basically moves it to the category of treatment requiring and they dinged you for that so look at your answers grade yourselves accordingly stars and uh and let's go to, let's see now here. Our next one we want to do is we want to do this guy. And this is a 570 grammar who was born at 24 weeks, a little peanut you could hold in the palm of your hand and is now 38 weeks, which if we're going to see bad things happen is a kind of classic time for bad things to happen. And so again, the um, stars, you guys are up on this right eye. And let's look here and we've got- I can take number, this. Number of different views. And the one thing I wanna draw your attention to, photos at times, it's hard to see things. And we're really not gonna see much of zone three in the photos like you do clinically. So most of our action is gonna be either zone one or zone two, but we're looking at something out here. And uh, let's go through these pictures. Mm -hmm. And so that's the right eye. What zone are we in and what type of changes and how bad are they? So I did see the bridge. So I would, well, it's, it looks like when we're looking at the central view, it's not really visible to me so i would call it zone two okay and what type of changes are there i so i've can we go back and magnify the view please to that uh, more temple picture please sure let's look here there you go thank you so i don't believe that i see any blood vessels um, I'm trying to decide whether or not I would call this popcorn. Um, Forget popcorn. Don't worry about popcorn is an irrelevant side issue. Okay. What you're looking for is neovascularization. Popcorn mm -hmm. is just something is there when you had neovascularization and it's no longer connected. So don't get hung up. We don't want to get hung up on that. I would kind of focus on, do you see a line? Do you see a ridge or do you see extra retinal neovascularization? on a ridge so, let's just focus our attention on that and that's where the money lies in terms of this so do you see normal retinal vascularization or a I line normal, or a ridge or i saw i see retinal vascularization up to um 
up to a line, but then there is a pink line and another line, which makes me think that this could be a ridge. Okay, um, so but you got to make a decision. What are you going to call it? <laughs> I'm going to call it a, a ridge and say two. Okay, now is there plus disease? No, no. I don't see any tortuous vessels. Okay, and so category, this would, do we have some ROP? Yes, yes we or do. No? It's mild. Mild. Okay. Is this APROP? No. No. And when would you see the child again? Uh, probably two weeks. Okay. Two weeks. Um, and now let's go to the other eye. Good job, Lydia. <laughs> Lydia, that was great. You went through that very well. And I like the way you think about this stuff. This is good. Um, now, um, for our uh, the, the wizards here, this is the left eye. And we're going to look here and stop me if you see anything. I want to, sometimes these photographs, it can be hard, but there is some hazy thing out here. And um, this is a nice posterior pole view to look at those vessels. Keeping in mind that when we're talking about plus and pre plus, we're talking about things right in the posterior pole, not out in the periphery. And that, that's what they're giving you to look at here. And so, what do you think? No plus disease. I'm having hearing, whoever's talking, I'm having trouble hearing you. Can you hear me now? Uh, let me. I put you up here. I can't, I can't hear Sean, you. I can't no, Sean, hear you. you. Sean, you sound really uh, distant. Like you're at the bottom of the ocean. Is it is it clear now? Yep. Much clearer. Okay. <laughs> We're thinking similar to the other eye. Zone two, stage two. Okay. No plus disease, mild ROP, no APROP. You went back to bottom of the ocean temporarily. Whatever just changed, uh, changed things from my end here. Um, but I can still hear you. Um, no APROP. And when would you see the kid in follow up? I think I want to say one to two weeks. I don't disagree with two, but I, but uh, okay. Yeah. There we go. And let's, let's submit this again and see where we wind up. And boy, the wizards nailed things here. And let's go back and see if it'll let me look here. And guess what? The stars nailed things too. So I think, actually, no, we didn't go back. So I'm still looking at the same thing. Let me close this. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, I want to resume where I left off. And wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's okay. the tutorial. Oh, go to the yeah. second. Um, here. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, let's go back to here and let's go to the right eye. And the right eye. This is, yeah, we're right eye. Let's look at left eye now. In left eye, so you guys both did well. So grade yourself. Yay. So any discussion on that? One thing I want to draw your attention to, this is useful. They're saying this is twice this distance. This is the outer extent of zone one. You're clearly seeing vessels if you're worried about are we in zone one or zone two. Let's go on. A question just just to clarify the bottom part if, if you see this kid uh, in the NICU uh, yep. how long until you see them again I would see him in one week okay I'm on the, the the conservative end of that from my perspective I see any kid that is in a situation where they could conceivably become a treatment needing patient in one weekly until they're they're not in that situation um, and um, I think that once you've got, if you've got incomplete vessels uh, in, in zone two, there are many people who would wait and see them in two weeks. And that's probably what they want you to say if you're doing this on OCATS. Um, but personally, if they're incomplete in zone two, they could change. They could change a lot. And I see them back weekly if they're in the NICU. Thanks. Yeah. And, but though, no, though, and, and those are judgment calls. You know, it's not a, Wait a I minute. do have a question, if it's okay to ask that. Yeah. 
Um, I think what I feel like I would struggle with the most on, on these is to decide whether or not it's APROP. And I know that it's kind of uh, like well, uh, very posterior uh, yeah. and that it looks a little different, but I'm just trying to really understand what uh, well, the idea with this, Lydia, is that instead of the traditional line ridge extra retinal knee of vascularization, which is usually pretty easy to see in a lot of patients in zone two clinically, you wind up with flat, diffuse knee of vascularization in either zone one or a, a very posterior zone two. And it doesn't look like classic ROP. And that's when most people would apply the term aggressive posterior ROP. And we have a healthy respect for it. If you look back at the cryorop data, we um, put um, the uh, cryorop data uh, uh, in the zone one disease folks. Um, we took them from a 100% dismal outcome to a 90% dismal outcome. Um, so we salvaged maybe 10% of those eyes and the rest of them were all irretrievably blind. Um, so that, you know, I mean, that, and it was a big learning curve doing cryorop with these kids. And it turned out we were killing the eyes with cryo um, because of the amount of the eye that needed to be treated. But this is something that you'll get a handle on as you look at these patients, okay? And look at pictures of it and we can sit down and talk about it. Um, Thank you. Yep, let's uh, move on here and we're gonna go to a third patient here. And this patient, now we're gonna go through, and again, it's uh, back to the stars and, and uh, uh, being the right eye specialist today. We've got uh, this patient who is a 1200 grammar, bigger kid, now 38 weeks, born at 31 weeks. And so still in the range where we'd screen the kid, but we're, we're probably not too worried. And you're seeing nasal, temporal, the posterior pole, and then temporal retina. And um, that's what they're gonna show us. Um, Stars, what do you think as you look at this patient? You wanna take this one, Tony? I don't think... Tony's here, but I oh, can. Oh, or Brandon. It. Brandon, Brandon, you're, you're, you jump in there, buddy. There you go. All right. So I would probably say for this patient, it doesn't really look too severe to me. I'd probably say zone two. Okay. Um, zone two. Yeah. Cause you can't see zone three. Right. But just because of the, 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 the way this is set up, uh, zone three is going to be a bad answer for any of these patients just to kind of pass <laughs> head along. And uh, now, do you see ROP? I do not. If you want to go back to the nasal aspect, I didn't really appreciate a demarcation line anywhere, but okay. I can double check. Um, Magnification. Even. Yeah, if you can magnet. Yeah, I don't really see a Okay, I don't either. Line, so, so I would say zero. Zero, okay. And is there plus disease? Nope. Okay. Is there ROP category? No, no. no none, right? None. In this is this a, and no, no. And now this kid where you've got, it's not letting me select that. Um, darn. And I'll try that again in a second. What, um, and when do you want to see the kid in follow up? Two weeks. Okay. And oh, now it's selecting it for me. How about that? And two weeks. And then let's go to the left eye. All right. Wizards, you're up. Wizards, um, let's look here. This is, and you can look with some magnification here if you want, uh, getting a nasal view here and look way out here and uh, see if you can hallucinate a, a line or a ridge out there uh, and uh, look at the poster pole vessels while we're here. And the other thing to pay attention to is do I see what look like normal arcades or is everything dragged with the vessels straightened? And those vessels to me look pretty good. Um, and then look out here temporally and we can look with a little magnification and what do we see there? Anybody want, who wants to take this that hasn't uh, already spoken? Let's rotate this around with the wizards. 
I can do this one, Dr. Hoffman. Sure. So um, I think same kind of as the other team zone two. Um, could you go back to the nasal view? Yes. And uh, there's some debate about whether there's a demarcation line. Uh, I'm going to say there's, it's hard to see, but I think there is a line. So I will call it stage one. Okay. Um, and it's not letting me, it may let me check it in a second. It's not letting me do it now. Maybe it'll show up. And is there a plus disease? No. Is it pre plus? Sorry, I meant, sorry, my answer to that was no. <laughs> oh, no, okay. And yes, it is saying stage one and it is selecting it eventually. And then so we have mild type two or treatment requiring ROP, being that we've called it stage one. I would say mild, no, and two weeks. Okay, very good. Well, we will submit that and see where we wind up. And I think that they thought this was no ROP. You can hallucinate a line out there and it's you don't want to get burned on that either. But I think they're calling this basically incomplete vessels in zone two saying we could see the patient in two weeks. Let's see if it'll let us look at the right eye. It does on this one. So it looks like our stars kind of get their points on this one, gradures individually. And then wizards here are the answers here. And let's go to another one here. And now this patient is going to, we're going to shift gears a bit here. And Lydia, this may help you a little bit here. Um, and so you want to pay close attention to this patient. Stars, who's up? We're going to look. I think it's me if Tyler is, uh, is busy and happy to take this okay. one too. And so I want to draw your attention to the location of the optic nerve, the location of the fovea, and some stuff that might be going on here. Okay. Yes. And and let's just look at that with a little magnification. And I want you to look here. And this is a pretty good picture in this right eye of posterior pole vessels. Keeping in mind, we're looking for dilation and tortuosity. <laughs> and uh, um, this is our temporal uh, retina here in this right eye. Um, and there you go. Now, yeah. so uh, what do you think's going on here? And, and uh... yeah, so I would say zone one. It's very posterior. Okay. Uh, I would say at least stage three. I actually pulled it up on a laptop as to not embarrass myself again in front of my junior team. But um, I. Junior. <laughs> I think it's, at, I do see some fine vessels coming over. I think that's probably stage three. And I okay. would say that there is plus. Okay. And I think that this is, well, this is treatment requiring um, ROP, um, but you can see Lydia, I've seen one patient with uh, aggressive posterior when we were doing ROP rounds on my PEDS rotation and it looked just really angry. The, it's not just plus, but the, you can see how, there's venous and arterial, just really, really major tortuosity. I would probably, I mean, I would probably call this aggressive posterior. Okay. And let's you now. This on patients with aggressive posterior ROP, because it looks like this one is a little bit more hazy. Is that something that you would see in clinical exam as well, or is that just this photograph? Well, it could just be a bad photograph, but it turns out that smaller, uh, uh, more premature kids are often you know, their vitreous is a bit more hazy. Um, you could also have some blood in the vitreous. Um, now let's have the wizards um, look at this left eye, okay? And the left eye, we're going to look here, and let's just magnify this a bit and take a look again, and you can see something going on right through here. Notice the distance from optic nerve to fovea and where that is. And you see something going on here. And I agree, Lydia, the view is a bit hazy, isn't it? And let's keep looking at this eye. Um, and, and there we are. And, and let's look up here because I think that there's some other stuff going on here that is probably meaningful as well. 
Um, who wants to take this? I can do it. Sure. Um, so this looks like it is uh, zone one. Um, I would probably call this stage three, given the NV. Okay. Um, this is definitely looks like plus disease to me. So it'd be treatment requiring ROP, but also AP ROP. Let's see how we did. Wow. Yay. Wizards are good. Go wizards. Huh? Go look at this. Go stars. Um, yeah, this is now, Lydia, back to your question about this. The thing that is most striking here when you look at this, even with magnification, you don't see that classic elevated neovascularization. The neovascularization can be flat on the surface of the retina. And the way we were debating this, when we first saw kids with this back in cryorop, we said, well, gosh, this kid doesn't look that bad. And they'd go down the tubes. These eyes can go south in a hurry. Um, if you were in doubt about whether to treat this kid, you want to see this kid again in a day or two. And um, but but both of these eyes need to be treated and they need to be treated soon. And the preferred treatment would be to do um, anti-VEGF um, because it is going to cause us to regress and it's going to allow some persistent vascularization to occur. Uh, whereas with laser, you're going to have to laser a whole lot of the eye. These are eyes um, that can develop anterior segment ischemia and bad things. Um, so we don't want to uh, um, have, uh, uh, you know, a, a situation where we, again, like with cryo, caused enough damage to the eyes that the eyes didn't survive uh, uh, to see. Um, that unfortunately is what we learned from some of the patients we treated in cryorop with very, very posterior ROP. Um, other questions, comments about this patient? Because this is something I want you guys to remember. And it is the, the dilation and tortuosity of those vessels. This is plus disease. And this is a patient, when you see this, that you need to push the panic buttons on. They need to be treated. Comments, questions? Thank you. That made, makes a lot of sense now. Yeah. So you won't see classic neovascularization and it isn't going to be neat and tidy for you. And let me go. And we have now, let's look here um, at this one. And this one, this is again, an, an interesting patient uh, and stars, you guys are up, whoever's up to bat and uh, we're going to look at this patient, and this patient is a 630-gram kid uh, who was born at 24 and a half weeks, now 37 weeks, so in prime, I'm going to get ROP and need to do something territory, and if we look here, I want to draw your attention out here to this, this stuff right here, these here, and um, let's I think if Tyler is still busy, it would be me again. Okay, uh, good. So we're going to look through these pictures. Okay. And this is your nasal retina in the right eye. Again, drawing your attention to this here. And um, this is just an anterior. And this we're going to loop around here. So this is the, that's the posterior pole picture looking at vessels. So we can come back here and look. One more time, nasally, yeah. and this is inferiorly, superiorly, and um, we're looking out here temporally. Here's yeah. optic nerve, there's fovea, and so uh, what do you think? What zone are we in? I think it's zone two. You got that? I, I That would probably be a reasonable thing based on what we've just seen. And what stage ROP do we have, if any? Um, we do have ROP. Uh, looking at it, it looks like there is a ridge, just because I see these uh, two lines with the line in between. And yeah. the view just got a little hazy, but it looks like there are neovascularizations um, just in the view that we're looking at. So I would call it stage three. Okay. 
and oh, plus geez. disease, pre plus disease, or or or, or no uh, uh, vessel dilation and tortuosity. That's a tough one. When I'm looking at the vessels, I I think it's not as torturous as the previous one, but that one vessel that is kind of making the zigzag in the like close to the out and then inferiorly. Um, I'm going between yes and no. So I wonder if I should call this pre plus. Uh, okay. And is it uh, none mild type two or treatment requiring? That would be, I don't think it's treatment requiring. And if we call it pre plus, we would go with type two. Yeah, okay. I think I, I agree with that. Just agree with that. And, uh, and what about, uh, is this APROP? I guess I say no. Okay, and now, and it'll it'll show up in a second. When do you want to see this kid again? I would see them closely just because of the, if I think it's pre plus disease and stage. That would be A, B, or C. A. Uh, A, yeah. Good job. Good job, Lydia. Okay, A. now, it's not letting me do that um, for whatever reason. Isn't that nice? Let's Look at the other. Remember that, and we'll see where it where it, it it puts it, and it'll probably make us select something before we can finish up. Now, wizards, left eye specialists here. This is a hazy picture, um, and we're looking at posterior vessels. But these are our posterior vessels, and look at that venous vessel. Look at this arteriolar vessel, and we're going to keep going here and. See if we see something down here. Let's look at this. Okay. And what are we, is there something going on there? Maybe, huh? And let's look here. Nothing to be gained there. And this is our, again, optic nerve. Our phobia is about here. And so we've got something going on out here. Let's magnify that and take a look at it. And so let's go back there, come here. And again, left eye, and this is our fovea, and we're noticing this stuff here. And uh, who's going to tackle this for the wizards? I think it may have come back around to me. Okay. okay. Zone two. Okay. Stage three. Yes. Three plus. Three plus. This is type two or mild. So what does that make us? Type two. Okay. No. Agree with the follow-up. Okay. And let's go back to the right eye and see if it'll let us. It did it, it did select things. It just didn't show them on my screen. So let's submit this and see how we did. Well, gosh darn, those those stars, they nailed it. Um, and let's look here at the wizards and you guys did well with that too. I think you guys are, 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 have obviously paid attention with some of this ROP stuff. And I think at, you know, this point, I'm going to probably shift gears. Um, what question now in terms of this, I think that you can go through this and I, I did wind up uh, diverting, uh, uh, accidentally to the hour. There's an ROP tutorial on the, uh, AOA uh, website as well. And it, that is definitely good and worth going through. Um, the cheat sheet that I put out has a list of pertinent issues that has to do with the stages, type one, type two, plus disease definitions. Um, and um, as opposed to conventional threshold um, and pre-threshold, which is a historical interest only, um, I think type one, type two are the, the way to go. Um, and the big issue, you know, with this uh, most recent iteration of ICROP is, you know, they, they want to recognize that there are some kids, particularly in developing countries, who are larger, who can have ROP that looks like aggressive posterior ROP out in zone two. Um, and be aware of that, particularly if you're traveling and looking at infants in, in foreign places. Um, that's why they changed the name to aggressive ROP. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to make a big difference in what we're doing because most of the kids here 
uh, aggressive posterior ROP is still going to be an appropriate term to use in considering things. Before we move on from ROP, other questions, issues, concerns? Okay, now I'm going to stop the sharing for that, and we're going to go back to this. And I got to get back now to do, 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 do. share screen. And we're going to want to do this share. Okay, now. And go back to this. And there we are. And now, adventures in retinoblastoma. Can you guys still hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Okay, good. Just and everybody's still awake. Anybody need let's let's just stand up, stretch, wiggle while I'm I'm kind of getting started to, uh, uh, with this. Uh, um, as far as a review of retinoblastoma, I'm assuming that you've looked at the stuff uh, uh, in uh, the, the talk that I provided and in both the PEDS and the uh, tumor book in the home uh, study course um, so that you're pretty much up to date as far as um, uh, mode of presentation. Realize the most common mode of presentation is leukocoria, um, at least in the US. Um, and it, you know, realize here, we usually see kids when, R, when RB is contained in the eye. Uh, when I am in Tanzania in two weeks, I will likely see at least one child with a fungating mass coming out of the head uh, with very advanced RB, um, which is essentially in that environment and in ours, almost a death sentence for the child. And that is what we're trying to prevent and uh, save eyes and save lives. Uh, You've reviewed the genetics and hopefully know a bit about associated tumors, uh, which unfortunately I have had considerable experience with. If you follow patients long enough, either they or their affected parents get uh, the uh, associated tumors. So my own thinking about this, first of all, do we have the right diagnosis? Secondly, can we save life first? Can we save the eyes? And what else to, to worry about? And then uh, uh, future issues. And future issues, uh, there are a lot of things that are really exciting ongoing. First of all, is the development of this field of ocular oncology, where we have people that specialize in this and offer all these high-tech things such as intra-arterial chemotherapy and intravitreal chemotherapy, um, which don't take lightly because there's risk of spread of tumor outside the eye at a time when you have tumor in the vitreous and you're putting a needle there. Um, so, um, those are really wonderful things. This patient I saw on a trip to Ghana, um, and this child is no longer with us. I mean, this was a virtual death sentence uh, in most environments, and certainly in Ghana. In fact, they disappeared uh, when the topic of doing uh, an orbital exoneration and uh, doing palliative care was brought up. Uh, I have a colleague in Surabaya, Indonesia, who spends about three quarters of her time, she's an ocular oncologist, oculoplastic surgeon, uh, a combo uh, person, and she runs a palliative care um, uh, unit for children with metastatic or extraocular spread of retinoblastoma. And most of her patients don't live, but she makes their exit much more tolerable. Now, let's look at some patients um, to kind of put this in perspective in terms of issues going on here. Some of these patients are from a long time ago. Some are more recent. And uh, this three-year-old girl had this right eye that showed up with a, 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 a you know, a problem. And um, in looking at her in, in clinic, she'd actually been seen by another ophthalmologist uh, who told the family that the child had a retinal detachment in this eye and sent her to me saying, I would be able to arrange to have it fixed because they didn't want to discuss the topic at hand uh, and broach the fact that the child had a tumor in the eye. And so this was the right eye. Um, I want you to notice this. C can you all see this? Yes. yes. Okay, good. This large mass with blood vessels in it, 
This lighter stuff right here is calcium in the tumor that you can see clinically. What are these things right here? Seeds. Seeds. Those are vitreous seeds. This is a large vitreous seed. And another view of that. And uh, um, so that if we were to say, let's go back to this patient and we're looking at this patient and the other eye looks absolutely perfectly normal. When you see this patient, one of the first things that you want to do is do an exam under anesthesia. It's never appropriate to give patients advice about treatment for retinoblastoma without doing an exam or anesthesia. When I took oral boards, one of the questions asked was just to sort out whether or not I would feel that I could make the diagnosis and offer treatment based on a clinical exam or we'd go to the OR. Go to the OR, you need to look, and I prefer to have two examiners look at the entire surface of the retina. Looking at this, this eye, with large tumor overlying the optic nerve and massive seeding of the retina, what, what group, as far as the A, B, C, D, E classification, would you put this I in? I would call it group D because it has extensive vitreous seeding, but it's not yet 50% of the globe. Uh, that it's occupying, at least from the pictures, from the picture that you're showing. Yep. And um, the other eye looks great. And th this actually was close to 50% of the globe, but I called it a D to E, uh, um, you know, category. And uh, this was a uh, patient was seen before the days of intraarterial or intravitreal chemotherapy. So this eye, what, what other treatment modalities would you have that would be able to treat large tumors and vitreous seeds? Did you say intraarterial? Uh, there's no, this was before, before anybody had done intraarterial, it didn't exist yet. Your options would be a nucleation, external beam radiation, systemic chemotherapy, um, laser treatment, um, and, you know, to go through those, is um, laser treatment going to help treat these seeds or the size of tumor that we have here that's very elevated? No. No, not a chance. Um, would external beam irradiation possibly treat the patient? Possibly. Uh, but you'd have significant collateral damage and, and uh, almost no one would offer that as, as prime treatment now because of the collateral damage to surrounding structures and the risk of inducing uh, you know, radiation field tumors. Um, would, and, and so what we offered this child and, and the family was, you know, I mean, the appropriate thing with this was to, the eye was removed. Um, and when you look at that, and this was strictly, this was unilateral retinoblastoma with seeds, not bilateral, not hereditary. The genetic testing was negative. And this child went on to do perfectly well, never had another issue with this. This was not a good seeing eye to begin with. Um, and uh, for this family, it was the right decision. Um, and they did well. Uh, if you have questions, concerns, comments on any of these, uh, interrupt and we'll talk about it. This again is a child who's presenting finding was six months of strabismus um, sent in by the uh, pediatrician, no family history. And this is the, um, uh, the, 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 the finding here in this eye. And this is the other eye. And this eye, left eye, was normal out to the aura serrata, 360 degrees, two different examiners. So we have this large posterior tumor uh, in this eye. What are our treatment options here? I mean, historically, yeah. Do you, you guys ever do chemotherapy for tumor reduction and then followed by external beam radiation therapy? Not usually external beam unless it doesn't respond to other modalities, but the idea of 
doing, let's say, systemic chemotherapy in the days before, you know, intra-arterial um, was done. I, I've done it, and you'll see more of it here, where we've done chemo reduction, and then um, additional to get tumors to consolidate and shrink, and then treat what's left. And we have occasionally used this IMRT radiation uh, uh, treatment um, that uh, our colleagues at Huntsman can do uh, to try to avoid damage to other tissues if we have something that isn't responding as we would like. Uh, but that's very rare to use uh, uh, um, you know, external beam radiation as a primary treatment for anything. Uh, but after chemo reduction, it's very common to use laser, sometimes even a plaque uh, radiotherapy. Um, and um, you know, Eric Hansen is our, our uh, kind of uh, uh, treatment specialist now, and he's geared up to do intraarterial, intravitreal plaque radiotherapy. Um, and so you'll see him in the course of your training probably doing all of those things. And let's look, and I think that this, just to spill the beans, is how things looked after um, six rounds of increased in carboplatin etoposide. Um, this is a seeing eye. It doesn't have its vision, you know, in, in the 2200 range. Um, uh, no radiation. And this child required virtually no laser. This tumor is completely regressed. This is calcification. This is all flat, dead tumor. This is an area where we had subretinal fluid. Um, and this eye continues to look just like this many years later. And the other eye remained normal. Um, genetic testing uh, showed this, uh, you know, to not be a, a germline mutation. Uh, um, but again, you always want to suspect it if you don't have tumor to look at. So you're looking specifically for a specific deletion. I found that genetic testing is not as useful. Um, and let's look another patient. And this patient's referred for bilateral retinoblastoma. Somebody actually told the parents what they thought they had, which I appreciated very much. Um, and this patient was sent up from St. George. I saw her on a Wednesday afternoon in clinic, did an exam, sent her for an MRI scan, which is something I always get before the EUA, in part to try to get another way of looking at tumors and to look at the optic nerves and the wall of the eye for possible spread through the wall of the eye. Um, and I got a panic call from the radiologist. Um, and I want you to look at these photos. And when you look at this, this patient was seen by a colleague of mine whose uh, uh, thoughts I always uh, uh, trust. Um, and she saw this kind of fluffy gray mass here in the posterior pole in the right eye. And um, in, you'll notice that there is another one here. There's a tiny one here. And when you look in the left eye, we see this kind of fluffy, stringy stuff that looks like some early local seeds, possibly. Um, and this lesion and this yellowy stuff here on ultrasound um, looked like it was a little bit of calcification which they can't tell you about with an MRI. And so panic call from the radiologist. And um, uh, what do you think the radiologist um, uh, uh, had, had to say? What, what did the radiologist find? A pineal gland tumor. That would be a very good guess. And I was going down that same road uh, when I picked up the phone, that's what I thought I was going to hear. But I also was a little suspicious about something else based on the appearance of this lesion in that it turns out when I saw the kid in clinic and heard about seizures and developmental delay, there is another disorder that can look like retinoblastoma that this child turned out to have. If we look back, yeah. at, what's that? Yes. Yes, that is absolutely what she has. She's got tuberous sclerosis. And these, remember, astrocytic hamartomas in TS in infancy are often, 
and, and you know, as a toddler, not calcified. And so we've got lesions all over here, uh, TS. And I can tell you that these lesions in this child look exactly the same. I followed her through childhood, not that we had to do repetitive exams on her anesthesia to look at these. Um, it, the reason we did exams on her anesthesia is she's on Sabral uh, by Gabitrin, which is the magic bullet for seizure control. It's a known retinal toxin. And we were doing surveillance looking uh, for that toxicity. But keep in mind, there's a long differential diagnosis. I would recommend that before you do your oral boards, you have a list of at least probably 15 things that could be on the list uh, for, for RB, um, because somebody's going to ask you that. Um, and they're going to be sitting there with a checklist, and chances are it's going to be somebody that doesn't do retinoblastoma, that doesn't hasn't seen one since residency, who's doing a checklist on a little thing there. You need to be able to rattle things off, um, and they're not going to be able to make decisions, so have a big list. Um, now, moving on, this is a little boy who showed up with a white reflex, and... Um, this kid caused me lots of stress and aggravation over the years, and I still follow him now, and he'll be followed by Eric Hansen. Um, and this was the right eye at presentation. Now, these cysts are important in that this, looking at this, is very obviously, from my perspective, retinoblastoma. It doesn't look like anything else. When you see these cystic changes, these changes are the changes of well-differentiated retinoblastoma that often doesn't change much with treatment, but should have a pretty good prognosis as long as things look okay. But when we looked in his left eye, we saw this tumor and all of this debris. And what are these white things here that are obstructing our view of the retina and these tiny little things? Anybody? Interesting. They're seeds. So this left eye, the left eye, um, lots of seeds, active, you know, tumor in both eyes. And I had a long phone conversation uh, the day evening. I saw the kid with Carol Shields in Philadelphia. And Carol recommended that we go for six cycles of incristin, carboplatin, etoposide. Um, and we did that. And the seeds looked a bit better, but still remained. And so I sent them off to Philly for intravitreal melphalan, um, which she gave him and then sent him back to me for follow-up. And about a week after he got back, I got a panic call from mom one night, uh, very late, saying that this child was just in agony. Could I see him the next day? And um, this is another picture of that eye. And this is the picture when he came in for an urgent examiner anesthesia with his left eye uh, that had been treated. Um, and you notice he's got diffuse blood in the anterior chamber. We have no view posteriorly. Um, and this was a blind, painful eye that had had active tumor in seeds. I had a discussion with Carol and we decided to recommend take the eye out. And when Nick looked at the eye in a path lab, Everything in the eye, the retina, the tumors, the lens, the iris were in various states of uh, uh, decomposition. Everything was necrotic. And um, they were not able to explain that in Philly. The nearest thing I could come to was that there had probably been some sort of decimal point error in the melphalan dosing. And I suspect that he got probably 10 times the dose he was supposed to get although no one was able to confirm that on the other end, um, they shook their heads and were not able to explain it. The plot thickens. This child now has the right eye um, that didn't change much with the chemotherapy we did, but six months later has sheets of vitreous seeds and these tumors that remained unchanged otherwise. And the question is, what do we do now? Do you primarily enucleate this eye and make the child bilaterally blind? Or do we do really the only treatment option we have that's good for vitreous seeds is intravitreal chemotherapy. Um, and I sent him off to see Aparna Ramasubramanian um, who was with us and then went to Louisville. 
and she did intravitreal melphalan in this child's only seeing eye, and the seeds left, and this is the appearance, and these are changes left where he had all those seeds, and some of the changes from the melphalan is somewhat toxic to the retina, um, even in an appropriate dose, but he remains tumor-free, having very useful vision in this eye to this day. Uh, but that was a very, very difficult decision for me to work through, to send him off for the treatment to be done in his only eye that had destroyed his other eye. Um, these decisions at times are difficult. Now, moving on, we've got another patient, 16-month-old boy, left esotropia, um, comes in for examination. Pediatrician saw something funny in the red reflex and wanted me to take a look urgently. So instead of seeing him a month or two down the road, we saw him about a day after the pediatrician saw him in Jackson. And this is the left eye with a large intraocular tumor and multitudes of sheets of vitreous seeds. Uh, part of the retina detached. And this is the right eye. This is his better eye with these big dilated vessels and a large intraocular tumor in the posterior pole and multiple other tumors. And the question again is what to do. And this poor little guy did have six cycles of chemotherapy, subsequently had intra arterial chemotherapy in both eyes intravitreal treatment in the left eye, left eye that I with all the seeds was ultimately removed. The right eye is stable, is seeing, um, and he is tumor free at present. So it often requires a juggling act of different modalities in terms of chemo reduction and additional treatment to get these kids taken care of. Um, another view of him, this is the most recent picture that I have that we took with our RETCAM here of his right eye with flat regressed tumor. Notice the yellow pigment in the macula, and these are just flat dead tumors. Um, and so that's a save. Um, a view nasally of that same eye. And one more here, this is, this is a patient who has Again, large tumor in the right eye, vitreous seeds, and, and this eye, um, he wound up with intraarterial chemotherapy in both eyes, lost the eye with that larger tumor, um, and this is post-treatment of all of the, the seeds and everything, and he's got a recurrent tumor that's just been treated with laser, but this eye has a normal optic nerve macula and perfectly normal vision in his one remaining eye. And this shows tumor, other eye, um, completely regressed. And this other illustrate a little different topic. You look at this eye, this guy was noted to have nystagmus and referred for evaluation. And we saw him in our clinic. Um, and I looked in the right eye and said, oh, this is bad. And then I looked at the left eye and said, oh, this is worse. And this child, um, the question is what to do. Uh, you don't know, enucleate both eyes. The tumor looks very similar in the two eyes. And um, this is the appearance after six cycles of encrystin carboplatin etoposide in both eyes. Um, and this is completely regressed tumor. He's got vision in the 2200 range. It's allowed him to function as a sighted child in school. And he's done well. Now, let's go back up. A couple other things to touch on. When you see anyone with retinoblastoma in this day and age, you need to think about genetic testing and you need to think about keeping them involved with oncology for future treatment or a future follow-up because of the risk. What is the risk of uh, developing additional tumors? If you're talking, let's say we're talking in clinic to a patient who's got bilateral retinoblastoma, is there a quick way to think about it in terms of their risk of developing osteogenic sarcoma and other sarcomas just based on their genetic uh, makeup? Anybody? 
Are you still there? I mean, I, I think it, I think if anybody who has uh, retinoblastoma, they have the tumor suppressor gene mutation, and um, especially if they get ex uh, radiation therapy that increases their risk, the most common would be sarcomas. I thought radiation field, the, the thing that, and, and based on Dave Abramson's uh, paper, which is probably the best on this uh, out, of, out of the, you know, New York, um, uh, kids irradiated under a year of age, particularly under six months of age, are particularly at risk uh, for radiation field tumors. But the risk of distant tumors, not related to radiation, not directly related to treatment, is about 1% per year. So by the time, if I had a bilateral germline you know, mutation retinoblastoma, my risk of developing additional tumors goes by, at, at my age, I would have a almost 70% risk per year of developing tumors. And that's why you don't see a lot of very old patients. Um, and I have personally had kids' parents die of secondary malignancies while I'm taking care of them. Um, I have had uh, older teenagers and young adults die of the consequences of either their sarcoma or treatment of it. Um, and so I make a huge point of having the, the, the germline mutation kids followed up at least yearly in uh, the oncology clinic. And they have a clinic for these uh, uh, RB survivors that they rolled them into at Huntsman. Um, the other issue to consider is the this issue, and somebody mentioned it earlier, trilateral RB. And trilateral, the risk of that is mainly in early childhood. Trilateral RB is basically a, 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 a peanut, you know, this uh, primary neuroectodermal or primitive neuroectodermal uh, tumor uh, in the pineal um, that is shares some common tissues and development uh, with retina. And um, it is a bad thing to develop. Most of the kids who develop it do not survive. Um, and uh, uh, we look for it to try to treat it and identify it early and to uh, um, you know, shunt their hydrocephalus and try to deal with other issues that are going to make them miserable. But it is a bad, bad thing to develop. Uh, there also is an overlap genetically between RB and neuroblastoma. I've had one patient who showed up while his sister was being treated after she had a bone marrow transplant uh, following treatment for neuroblastoma, and he had bilateral, you know, germline mutation, uh, a retinoblastoma. Um, no one could find the exact, I mean, both of them are, the abnormalities are due to suppressor gene uh, abnormalities, but retinoblastoma remains fascinating. I would urge you to uh, uh, maintain an interest in it in one way, shape, or the other. You'll probably encounter patients with it. Um, and if you have a real interest in this, talk to Dr. Hansen about being an ocular oncologist. Maybe he'll start a fellowship. Um, now, going to shift gears. One thing that, has be, uh, that I've encountered on tests is the malignant melanoma as well. And uh, I think the question I had is, was what is the second most common tumor outside of the field of radiation? And I think it's important to know for us that the osteosarcoma is the most common one, but then inside the field of radiation, it's fibrosarcoma and outside it's malignant melanoma. Would you agree with that clinically? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's true. And the other question they might ask you that I might ask you if we're doing oral boards is what is the most common secondary malignancy during systemic chemotherapy for retinoblastoma? I'm not sure if I know that. It's, a, it's AML, acute myelogenous leukemia. And, and that is a, a discussion that the oncologists have when they talk about treating you know, parents. And, and I've had parents opt for a nucleation in a unilateral RB that would probably respond. This is in the days prior to intraarterial chemotherapy, which you'd clearly do now instead of systemic if you had the option in a unilateral case. Um, and it looked like the eye was salvageable. But prior to that, um, we did a fair amount of systemic chemotherapy for unilateral uh, RB if the eye looks salvageable with very good results. And I have not personally had a child develop uh, AML 
um, but it is a risk uh, that is real, uh, that is identified, and the on oncologists talk about it. Now, this is something that all of you have had some role in in your, your training, and um, hopefully you've had a chance to look through, again, the talk and the um, material that I, I, I put out. And those two books are sitting on Laura's bookshelf, if you haven't looked at them. The photos in there, um, I took most of them. Um, some of them are OK. Some of them are not so good. Um, and years ago, they were terrible because it was a handheld uh, 35 millimeter film camera uh, and a 20 diopter indirect lens uh, that I used to take the pictures. Um, now we talk about location distribution of hemorrhages, associated findings, sequelae, and then long-term things. This patient is the very first patient I saw as a resident um, with abusive head trauma. It was taken just prior to this child becoming a multiple organ donor. Um, he had been shaken and uh, beaten uh, by his father, who then came into the ICU at the University of Michigan looking for me with a gun uh, because I was the one who had said, that he'd abused his child. Um, I'd actually said that the child was abused. I didn't have any way of saying dad did it, but um, I think his behavior caused him some trouble in the future court proceedings. And fortunately, a nurse ushered me out the back of the ICU. Um, and I am here to tell you the story today and didn't get shot. Um, this was taken uh, through a, uh, um, a four mirror lens, uh, again, with a film camera uh, at bedside. Uh, we didn't have to dilate the pupils. They were fixed and dilated for us. Um, this picture looks a lot different. And this picture is um, taken with a ret cam, the very first generation ret cam. Um, and significance here is you see hemorrhages of multiple uh, uh, layers, superficial, pre-retinal, you know, nerve fiber layer, dot blot hemorrhages. Um, there is a subretinal hemorrhage under this part of the retina. And the optic nerve is not particularly swollen. So if someone, the, the question always gets raised, is this simply due to um, increased intracranial pressure? And when we see hemorrhages that extend from the optic nerve to the aura serrata in multiple levels, barring extreme accidental head trauma, and there are case reports of things that look just like this, um, with accidental head trauma, but those reports have involved a, a child that fell two stories onto concrete, a child that was involved in a um, 60 mile an hour, two vehicles going 60 miles an hour, head on car crash where the child was an unrestrained missile. And the uh, third one is a child who climbed onto a large console television stand and pulled a very heavy television set uh, over on his head and findings like this were present at autopsy. Barring those cases, which every defense attorney in the country that defends cases like this know intimately, um, this is highly suggestive of abusive head trauma. Another view, again, this is a left eye, same patient, very large pre-retinal hemorrhage. One of the things I want you to remember about this is that these very superficial hemorrhages the, the small pre-retinal hemorrhages, those can leave um, very quickly in 24 hours. They can disappear. Um, Gil Benenbaum uh, at CHOP published information about this. That is the reason for urgent consultation and for urgent photography to document things unless there are issues such as neurosurgical uh, you know, instability um, and they not don't want us to dilate pupils. Um, another view of the same patient. What is this? This is the optic nerve, the fovea is here. The picture's tilted a bit, mainly because I took it and I wasn't holding the darn camera straight. What is this white thing here? Is that stage two ROP? That's a big circumacular fold. It is absolutely a circumacular fold. Um, and that is important because circumacular folds, again, apart from severe, severe accidental head trauma, have only been reported in abusive head trauma. So this is one of the things that would allow me to say even more strongly that this is most likely a, the changes are the result of abusive head trauma. Now, having said that, 
Can we say that this is pathognomonic, that this is absolutely child abuse? You cannot. You have to interpret things in the view of the clinical findings. Another view of a circummacular fold. And again, for me, the fact that the optic nerve is not particularly swollen is useful because it means that you can say fairly likely that the changes are not just because intracranial pressure is elevated. Um, a close-up, similar view. And one of the questions that comes up is causation of the hemorrhages, causation of the circummacular folds. And this is a child who's got a circummacular fold that has vitreous traction documented, vitreous strands on OCT. Um, and the most plausible explanation for the etiology of this, and a lot of it is supposition, there's not a lot of hard data, um, is that there is there are strong vitreous attachments between the internal limiting membrane of the retina and the uh, uh, and the vitreous, uh, where in a particular in a young child the vitreous is more dense and more firm and less liquid um, over the posterior pole over the vessels, um, causing traction on those areas. And this is evidence, and I have used this paper in court educating attorneys and judges about um, uh, abuse of head trauma. Um, and again, showing this patient to again, give you an idea that when we see these things, these are not, this is not a sign of septicemia. This is just the reflection off of this dome-shaped pre-retinal hemorrhage in this patient. Uh, but these findings, barring some other explanation, are very suggestive of abuse of head trauma. Um, other pictures that we have here, and I'm going to flip through these, you can see patients like this where they have confluent retinal edema. The optic nerve is right here. This is part of a circummacular fold, and, and this is just eyes a mess. And one of the things I want you to take in looking here, this is optic nerve, circummacular fold here, large preretinal hemorrhage. And Lydia, the reason this picture is hazy, like back to the RLP things, when you're wondering about that, is that there's blood in the vitreous. All you need is one of these preretinal hemorrhages to break through into the vitreous. You wind up with diffuse blood in the vitreous. Um, and the vitreous hemorrhage alone can limit uh, vision, as well as the damage. And if you imagine the fine structural detail of the retina and it being essentially trashed with all of this swelling and traction on it, uh, it's no wonder that we have sequelae. Um, and this is a patient who this eye looks like this, this eye looks like this. And you say, well, gosh, the changes are only in one eye. How could that be? It turns out about 30 cases. The changes are unilateral, often on the sign where you have a larger subdural. You can see changes where it's hard to identify retinal structures. This is a circummacular fold. And there's a very large amount of blood under the retina, this premacular retinoschisis or splitting, which is present in this patient. Here's the edge of the schisis right here. Here's the fold. There's the optic nerve. Um, and this patient um, probably, you know, 24 hours ago had a lot more hemorrhages. But if you see this, you don't see optic nerve swelling. Child's ICP is probably not elevated. This can be all we see in an eye with abusive head trauma. Now this patient, another example of the unilateral findings, right eye, this eye looked perfectly normal and I got a good look out to the aura serrata and this eye has these diffuse hemorrhages. And this child, this was one where there was a confession. This child was, we know that this was abusive head trauma by shaking. You can see very large subretinal hemorrhages. You can see optic nerve swelling. Um, now, what do we see at pathology? What do you think? What have you guys seen with Nick looking at these eyes? Have all of you seen eyes that have been removed and sent by the, M the medical examiner? to the path lab in your path rotation? I'm not sure I actually ever have. 
Okay, Nick gets them, but they're probably few and far between. It turns out that he can corroborate the presence of hemorrhages in the retina when they look at the eye. So anytime a child dies of suspected abusive head trauma, I mean, they go to the medical examiner's office. They don't have an autopsy at the children's hospital. They go to the medical examiner's office. And we, I usually ask the folks taking care of them last in the hospital here and our pathologists to request that the ME send the eyes uh, to our eye path lab. Uh, it turns out that there are at least two things, these para, you know, the intrascleral hemorrhages around the optic nerve uh, and optic nerve sheath hemorrhages that you can't see clinically that Nick can find that have been found to be suggestive of abusive head trauma. Um, there is a lot of debate when in, in, in discussion in court when Nick has removed eyes and he's trying to talk about retinal hemorrhages, whether changes seen, particularly the circumacular folds, are an artifact of fixation. And there are unfortunately a lot of our ophthalmology colleagues and uh, a passel of folks in the pathology arena that make their living off of providing expert testimony in these cases. Um, there's an ophthalmologist in Colorado whose letterhead on his office stationery, uh, the first thing he lists is he is an expert witness in shaken baby cases. Um, I find that a little hard to take personally, and I would urge you not to follow that career trajectory. Um, and now what about sequelae of abusive head trauma? And this is something where the pediatric ophthalmologist, you know, I, I follow kids um, and I have seen, and I know some of you gotten calls where the person on the phone in the PICU says, this child isn't going to survive. They need an eye exam now. We drop everything. We run. We see the kid. We take pictures. And lo and behold, they take them off life support and they survive. And some of those kids go on to live pretty miserable, uncomfortable lives. And we try to make it as good as possible. Um, the things that are common threads for me are central or cortical visual impairment due to the brain injury, optic atrophy both associated with axonal injury and increased ICP, um, and then subretinal neovascular membrane formation. Now, this guy um, who is alive, is well, is a married, productive member of society, was shaken uh, by his father when he was six months old. And I was told that he wasn't going to live, we should come see him, and we took pictures uh, with the film camera, he had confluent retinal hemorrhages and edema everywhere and optic nerve swelling. And when all the dust settled, he developed these large raised lesions in the retina, optic nerve pallor, best corrected vision of 2200 in each eye. This is the other eye. Um, and I had Mike Teske uh, see him at the time. We did um, fluorescein angioscopy with them asleep in the operating room. These are subretinal neovascular membranes because of the location. This is before the days of VEGF treatment, anti-VEGF treatment um, for neovascularization. And we watched it and things have remained stable. Uh, this is an FA, left eye, and um, it's not progressed. Things have been stable. Now this, and you know what a normal OCT looks like, this is his OCT, right eye and left eye. Um, and it isn't ever going to change or get better at this point. Um, and I think that for me, you know, this guy is, is one of the kids that makes me, uh, uh, um, first of all, I, I don't trust it when someone says they're going to pass away. We drop everything and run and see them. But um, don't assume that the kids have gone on to pass away because some of them will come back and you get to follow them for a long time, watch them grow up. And, and um, he is about a plus eight hyperope. If we hadn't found that and put him in his glasses, uh, he would not be uh, seeing as well as he is. Um, and he, uh, you know, is a productive member of society uh, and is a, is a happy guy with a, a number of kids, uh, none of whom I have seen for abusive head trauma. Um, what burning questions or issues do you have 
uh, with, with uh, abusive head trauma. Any questions that have come up, problems that you've run into or concerns that you have? No, Dr. Hoffman, I feel like you should write a book of all the encounters you've had, especially with that dad that came in, to, that came in after you. Yeah, well, that was, uh, um, I mean, I had a nurse grab me and she said, there's a guy at the front desk with a gun. He's looking for you. You need to leave now. <laughs> and so there was a back stairway at Mott Children's <laughs> Hospital out of the, uh, the ICU. And uh, I went down it uh, pretty quickly. And they had the security dudes come get them. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was a little different. I think, you know, our, our security, the security guards there did not carry tasers. They carried large weapons. Um, and they all looked like ex members of the offensive line on the football team. Um, and so they, they very effectively took care of it. Nobody got hurt in the process. Um, but it's, uh, those are tough issues. You know, I think that um, these kids need thoughtful, ongoing care and, in it, and they need it at a time when they're usually in limbo socially. You know, they're often in the social services network. They may be in foster care or with a relative um, and it's so easy to lose track of them. So we really try hard to keep track of these kids and, and, and keep them going. I have one, little young lady who I, I still see. She is probably Catherine. I think she's older than you are. And she is at this point in a wheelchair. Um, she's been cared for by her um, paternal grandparents who have raised her from the time she was an infant. Um, and she is very low functioning, but they make her life as happy as possible. The real question is what's gonna happen to that poor young lady when her grandparents pass away because they are the only relatives she has that care anything about her existence or happiness. That's sad. Um, on that cheery note, um, unless I'm open any questions or issues in her, I'm gonna stop the sharing so we can kind of look at each other maybe. Um, Questions, concerns, and I do apologize for doing this on Zoom. As you're already aware, I'm not the most uh, facile with uh, Zoom. On the other hand, I didn't disconnect y'all. Uh, we did stay on for most of the time, and um, I haven't had anything bad playing in the background. Um, but um, next time we'll do something similar to this. Uh, if we do this uh, uh, again next year in uh, you know in person, I am hopeful. And otherwise, are you guys all uh, going to the meeting at Park City today? Um, I think some of us are going to clinic and then heading up after. But thanks so much, Dr. Hoffman. We really appreciate it. Now, this is this is, is my pleasure. And uh, look, if any of you have concerns about this, and know Lydia, I caught you off a little bit with some of the stuff about uh, you know as far as the uh, uh, APROP. I'm happy to talk through that with you. And I think that you know our goal when you're on our service is to have you do exams once a week with one of us. And part of that learning process is getting a, a sense for how we sort these things out. And I think it'll be a lot, lot clearer to you then, but you're, you're worrying about the right things already uh, for which I'm very grateful. Have a, a wonderful day, good weekend, happy Valentine's Day to everybody um, and uh, uh, stay healthy. See you guys. Happy birthday, Catherine. Oh, Catherine, is this your birthday? Yes, it oh, is. Here, let's, happy <laughs> Thanks, birthday. Everybody. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll leave it at that because you don't want me saying anything. Um, you guys have a have a great weekend and uh, enjoy the meeting. And I think Susan McDonald is up there. Somebody give her a hug for me. Okay. Yes, perfect. Thanks, Dr. Thanks, Dr. Hoffman. Hoffman. All right. Thank See you guys. You.